Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's dive back in. A uh, couple of orienting remarks before we get back to the next challenge in evolutionary robotics. Undergrads, you are uh, about to start in on the 10th and final assignment, so you're nearing the end. I just linked it in there uh, now. Through assignments one through nine, we've tried to keep everything as simple as possible. So in the spirit of the minimal cognition experiments, you've had a minimally complex robot, three links, two joints, a minimal complement of sensors, a minimal complement of motors, no hidden layer, just a few neurons, as few synapses as possible, simplest possible environment you can imagine for the robot, an infinite flat plane, and we've been using relatively simple optimizers, very low-powered, simple to code up evolutionary algorithms in assignment nine. So everything has been minimal, minimal, simple, 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 all the way along until assignment 10. In assignment 10, you're gonna go in and make your robot more complicated. There's only so much we can do with the three-link, two-joint robot, so you're gonna replace that very, very simple robot with uh, the quadruped, which is made up of eight links and, uh, sorry, nine links and nine joints. Still not very complicated, but it gets easy to get lost pretty quickly in assignment 10. You'll remember our discussion about absolute and relative coordinates when we were doing the joints assignment. That gets very confusing when we start to play around with more and more links and joints. So my advice to you, if you haven't tackled assignment 10 yet, is to do everything incrementally. Add one link and connect that new link with a joint to your growing robot. Debug the position and orientation of that link, the position uh, of the joint, make sure the joint normal is correct. There's a temptation to add all the links at once and, and connect them all up with joints. Cross your fingers, hit compile, and hope for the best. You all are probably sufficiently experienced coders by now to know what happens when you do things in that manner. So take your time, do things incrementally in assignment 10. And when we reconvene here, uh, when we reconvene here next Tuesday morning, uh, the undergraduates and those taking this course for graduate credit, you will have done with all the weekly assignments and you will be on your own for the rest of the semester. So next Tuesday, we will talk about final projects, how to navigate the final project, how to do well, what's worked for students in the past, what hasn't worked for students in the past, uh, and so on. All good? Okay, graduate students, uh, you are about to also tackle the very final assignment, which is the fifth and final differentiable assignment, which I haven't finished coding up yet. I was hoping to finish last night, I am racing to stay one week ahead of all the grad students in this class. I'm falling a little bit behind. I will put it up around 3 o'clock this afternoon, which means for the graduate students, D5 will be due at 3 p.m. next Tuesday. I will still give you a week to work on it. Fair? Okay. I know everybody's busy, myself included. We'll get there. Any questions about assignments, the differentiable assignments? All good? Okay, all right, so uh, we are working our way through open challenges, open problems in the field of evolutionary robotics. Uh, we looked at modularity or lack of modularity. We looked at the competing conventions problem and the solution to the competing conventions problem, which was neat. And then we looked, we ended last time by looking at hyper neat, which is a solution to a different problem. What's the problem that hyper neat helps to solve? If you remember why Hyperneat was designed, it's based on the basic idea underneath Hyperneat. What does it help with? It regulates um, like behaviors or shapes or whatever you want. To regular like behaviors, that. regular shapes. We are bilaterally, symmetrically shaped. The left side of our body looks like the right side of our body because that helps with a particular regular behavior that is important to us, which is usually bilateral uh, locomotion, as or bi bipedal locomotion in the direction in which our primary sensors 
face, right? So if you look across nature, organisms are not random collections of body parts, and they don't move in some random, uncoordinated way. There is regular pattern over time in the behavior of organisms, and there is regular spatial ordering in our bodies and also in our brains. So HyperNeat was designed to bias evolutionary search. Evolu HyperNeat is still an evolutionary algorithm. We're searching among the space of all possible things. Could be neural controllers for robots, robot body plans themselves. But HyperNeat tends to focus search in one part of the fitness landscape. And it's that part of the fitness landscape in which can be found regular patterns. OK. Today, we are going to start in on arguably the biggest, the hardest, and the as yet unsolved problem in the field of evolution and robotics, and many other branches of robotics, which is it's not that difficult to evolve or train a simulated robot in a simulated environment. If you've just finished assignment nine, you've had a little bit of experience with that. It's not trivial, but it's not that difficult. Once you have something in simulation that works, you have a robot that does something useful and presumably safe for humans to be around, how do we take that robot and transfer it to reality and ensure or guarantee that the physical counterpart, the physical robot, is going to exhibit that safe, useful, interesting, entertaining behavior in the real world. That is known as crossing the reality gap. And uh, this has been an open problem since the beginning of evolutionary robotics, the early 90s, but arguably going back even earlier than that. And again, although some people think they have good solutions to this problem, like NVIDIA, I would argue that it is still a difficult problem to solve. OK. In this segment, we are going to look at four different projects, four different attempts to cross the reality gap. They're all very different. There are many, many more attempted solutions to cross the reality gap than just these four. I picked them to be a representative sample. We're going to go back and look at uh, the first one in evolutionary robotics, which was published at the beginning of the field uh, in the 90s. And the basic idea behind this very first attempt to cross the reality gap is to sprinkle a lot of noise into the simulation itself so that evolution cannot latch on and exploit some feature of the simulated robot or its simulated environment that is constant, that doesn't change inside the simulation, but isn't real in reality. There are many of these constant features in your simulators that don't exist in reality. What are some of them? At the end of assignment now, you should have a minimal, minimally complex creature running around in a simulated environment, which is pretty fake. Fake in which way? Which ways? There are many. So the plane is like flat and empty? Absolutely, right? This carpet looks pretty flat. It's not. Other features of the environment that are not real. If you were to take, if you got a nice gate for your three-link robot and I gave you a Lego construction kit and some motors to actually build it in reality, what's going to literally or maybe metaphorically trip, trip up the physical counterpart of your evolved robot? The links can go into each other? Absolutely. The parts, the links, the parts of the robot can interpenetrate, not allowed in reality. Unless we build the parts out of like nerf or foam, and then we could argue that interpenetration is kind of OK because it's soft. But what else? What other rules of this universe is your physics engine violating? Absolutely. So if you're prototyping a robot for NASA, and we're saying this is moving around on a, on a, a comet or a meteor, uh, or it's moving around in a vacuum with no wind, no air pressure, no oxygen, then OK, fine, but not on this planet. Other things that are not real. Oh, it's got discrete time steps. Discrete time steps, also not true, right? So from the point of view of your robot, it, uh, it doesn't have a camera, but it's got touch sensors. It's basically closing its eyes, and then it suddenly teleports a small distance in its world, and then closes its eyes and teleports again. We can make those moments of unconsciousness very, very brief, but
but they're still there. You, know? you may have seen this in assignment nine. You'll definitely start to see it in assignment 10. As always, uh, evolution, regardless of whether she is biological or artificial, is a, a satisficer. She will exploit whatever she's given. What uh, inaccurate features of the simulator have you seen your robots start to exploit? This one's a little trickier. Is your robot exploiting the fact that it's using through a va uh, moving through a vacuum? N not really, right? There's not mu literally nothing in a vacuum with, with, of which to exploit. Like, doesn't there need to be friction? Kind of, because like, the robot will just get here but also move? Uh, absolutely, right? So there is some friction set in, your, uh, in the ground floor. It's relatively low at the moment. So it's like moving over linoleum or maybe like rough ice. It, there's a little bit of friction, but not much. And you can see that the robot tends to evolve in many cases like walking on tippy toes. It takes lots of many small steps, which is actually maybe not a bad strategy if you're moving over low friction. But it's definitely exploiting that fact. And if we took that robot and built it in reality out of Lego and put it on this high friction carpet, that strategy is probably not going to work very well and your robot would fail to cross the reality gap. When we do more complex simulations, like you see the NVIDIA one here, there are many, there are much, there's much more physical detail in the physics engine and in the construction of the simulated robot itself. And a lot of those details are actually inaccurate or completely inaccurate. And there's more opportunities for an evolutionary algorithm to exploit all of those inaccuracies. So how do we keep artificial evolution from exploiting things that don't exist in the real world in the simulator? How do we keep her from doing that, but make sure that she does focus on evolving or tuning or optimizing those aspects of the robot and its interaction with the environment so that the robot does what it's supposed to do. That's what we're gonna look at in this first experiment. It's an old idea and NVIDIA has convinced themselves that they rediscovered it in 2018. And you can see that idea visualized in this screenshot. What's the trick? every possible situation. So it may be difficult to see from the screenshot if you're in the back, they're trying to train a robot arm to pick up this, or, or to hang this yellow cylinder on a string and drop the cylinder into the hole in the blue cube. And if you give one robot arm, one string, one cylinder, and one blue cube, it will learn to do it by exploiting some aspect of the actual geometry of that one yellow cylinder, the geometry of that one blue cube. That's not what you want to train the robot to do. You're not trying, or NVIDIA is not trying to train the robot to drop that cylinder into this cube. It's to drop cylinders into cubes. So pretty, it makes sense, right? Very intuitive. Train it on a whole bunch of different situations. So you'll notice that there are all sorts of different cubes. There are holes in these cubes at different relative positions. The holes are bigger or smaller. The cylinders are bigger and smaller. Basically force it to generalize across all these instances so that if NVIDIA takes one of the neural controllers that results from this experiment in simulation and drops it into a physical robot arm, from the point of view of that neural controller, it's experiencing yet one more cylinder and cube with a hole in it, right? Just one more case. It just, from our perspective, it's a, it's a particularly unique case. It's the first real cylinder and real cube that the real robot has experienced. But from the point of view of the neural controller, it's just another situation, yeah? Okay, so you can see from this picture what's being varied, what's not being varied in this picture. The robot itself is the same, yeah? 
the, envi the environment itself, right? It's all a flat floor. So there's features of the environment that are invariant here, but mostly it's the robot that stays the same. Remember our discussion about Rene Descartes way, way back at the beginning of the course, divide body and brain, body doesn't matter, let's forget about the body. You look at modern robotics, you can see that all the time, right? The focus here is on the neural controller that they're training and the environment of the robot, the cylinders and the cubes. They've forgotten about the robot's body itself. There's the simulated robot's body. You can imagine the physical robot's body looks more or less identical to that. Is it likely to be identical? The simulated robot arm and the physical robot arm. Okay, most of you are students of embodied cognition right now. You know that they may look similar, but there's bound to be mechanical differences between the simulated robot and the physical robot, no matter how accurate the simulator is and no matter how many fancy highfalutin GPUs we run the simulator on, there's bound to be differences. The reality gap is, is tricky, it's significant. Okay, all right, so let's go back in time to 1997 towards the beginning of evolutionary robotics and uh, at that time, as this field was starting, this idea of evolving uh, robots in simulation and then transferring them to reality was starting to occur to folks. And already there was, uh, people were starting to realize there's going to be a problem. Whatever we evolve in simulation, how do we transfer that uh, to reality? Now, this is a little tricky because physics engines didn't exist in 1997. Actually, they did exist. They were being coded up at uh, games companies, but they hadn't been released to the general public yet. Before there were physics engines, there were simpler models that we people were using, and we're going to look at some of those simpler models today. So throughout today's lecture, I'm going to talk about simulation, and for most of that, most of us, that sort of equates with physical simulation, the, the physics engines that you're working with. Those didn't exist yet. We're gonna just use simulation as a catch-all term for some simplified computational model in which we can do evolution and then try and transfer stuff to a real robot. Okay, all right, so the observation back at that, that time will, was evolution, artificial evolution, will probably create neural controllers that are gonna exploit details of the simulation. Perverse instantiation has been known uh, in AI and robotics for a very long time. Uh, that's another problem, obviously, related to the reality gap. So if evolution exploits the details in the simulation and those details don't exist in the reality, we have the reality gap. Whatever, whatever evolves in simulation is unlikely to transfer to, re, uh, to reality. So the hypothesis that was tested in this paper is to add noise to the simulator. And for our purposes, noise is going to be every time you construct and run a simulation, randomly alter one or more features of the simulator. But what features do you decide to add noise to to ensure that evolution is not going to exploit details, uh, incorrect details, and then you won't be able to transfer to reality? We could add noise to everything. Place the robot in high wind. Every step it takes across the ground is ice, then sandpaper, then boulders, uh, then loose sand, then shallow water. We could add tons of noise to every feature you can imagine. The robot's body changes at every time step. Its mass distribution is being juggled from time step to time step. Just, if we don't know what kind of noise to add, let's just throw tens uh, let's just throw tons of noise at the simulator. What's going to happen? Evolution is certainly not going to be able to latch on to any constant detail and exploit it to evolve the behavior we want in simulation. That's good. What's the problem? It won't evolve to do anything. It won't evolve to do anything. You can try this yourself with your setup now, 
artificial evolution will say, I'm just going to keep the robot where it is. It's too windy. It's too noisy. The robot keeps changing. I can't find any way to climb any hill in the fitness landscape. So there's a balancing act here. There's a Goldilocks zone between adding too much noise so that evolution can't make any progress in simulation and adding too little noise so that evolution starts exploiting facts uh, invariants in the simulation that have no correspondence in reality. Yeah? OK. So there's a question then that arises in this hypothesis, which intuitively makes sense. Which aspects of the simulation do we noisify? And the more complex the simulator it is, the more things we have to decide to noisify or not. Friction of the ground, the mass distribution of the robot's body, its geometry, the geometry of the robot itself, the properties of the joints, the properties of the sensors, the properties of the motors, uh, properties of the batteries, on and on and on we go. So this sounds terrifying because the more we want our robot to do, the more complicated a simulator we need to evolve it to do that, the more decisions we need to make about what to noisify and what not. So the solution that the authors came up with, the author came up with back in 97 was minimal simulation. What is the simplest possible simulation we can make? Uh, and the minimal simulation inspired some of the minimal cognition experiments that we saw last month. They're related. OK, so we're going to be looking at a minimal simulation now that contains as little detail as possible, but enough that evolution evolves something that transfers to reality. OK, so how are they going to do this? They're going to think about how to create a simulator for their robot first. And they're going to think about all the physical details that might exist in that simulator. The mass of the robot, gravity, friction, wind resistance, air pressure. And they're going to take all of those physical details and drop it into one of two buckets. The first bucket is the base set of robot environment interactions. So you can think of one, inter one, type, one kind of robot interaction is collision detection and resolution. Friction is a part of that, that uh, detail. So in the base set, these are things that we might get wrong. So friction definitely exists in the real world. So we want to put friction into the simulator. We might not know how much friction to add, but some kind of friction needs to be in the simulator. So that goes into the base set. Those are things that we might get wrong, but they need to be in there. They're important. If the robot has no friction, it's going to go nowhere in simulation, no matter how smart evolution is. The second bucket is basically artifacts. Uh, they call this the implement, implementation set of interactions. It's not a very uh, good term, in my opinion. Implementation, meaning to implement the simulator, they needed to put it in there, but it has absolutely no basis in reality, completely different from reality. What are some things we kind of have to put in the simulator but have absolutely no basis in reality? This is not so obvious to think of examples here. Any ideas? Is it like the floor again? Like so we need to like have some sort of surface. We need to have some sort of surface. That would probably go in the base set. We might not get the friction right, and no floor is perfectly flat. But yeah, we probably need a floor. Everything being a perfect shape. Yeah, that that's certainly something we can't get. We can't get right. What we're going to see in a moment is one, uh, one example of an implementation set are the sensors. So we've talked, about, uh, we've talked about infrared sensors in this class, sonar sensors, things that send out a signal that hits something in the environment and bounce back. And the time it takes for that signal to go out and come back to the robot, or in the case of organisms, for a bat, for example, when it sends out sonar. Getting the details of all of those signals going out and hitting something and bouncing back correctly as it does in the real world, it's, it's impossible. We could take all the computers on the planet at the moment and dedicate them to simulating one pulse of sonar, and we wouldn't be able to, to simulate it very well. It's 
basically impossible to simulate that well. So how an infrared sensor behaves in, uh, is, would probably be dumped into the second bucket. Any detail that evolution starts to exploit about how an infrared sensor works on a simulated robot, if it's exploiting that fact, that's a bad, bad thing. Evolution's getting addicted to something that's not going to exist in reality. Or it's going to exist, but it's going to be so different from whatever we simulate, we shouldn't simulate it. So seems, sounds like a catch-22, right? We want to evolve a robot with infrared sensors, but we can't simulate the infrared sensors. What do we do? This is actually tricky. Okay, so we're going to see how this works. So what they're going to do in this experiment, they're going to run things in a not a physics engine, but a simpler uh, simulated world for their robot. And they're gonna sprinkle noise on a whole bunch of different things. They're gonna sprinkle tons of noise on the things that they know that they can't implement well, like how infrared sensors, uh, how infrared light reflects back to the robot. They're gonna put 100% noise on that, and they're gonna put only a little bit of noise on the base set. So going back to this picture here, the NVIDIA folks know that the physical robot is going to encounter cylinders and boxes with holes in them. So vary the cylinders and the boxes a little bit. In this experiment, it was 10%, an arbitrary number. Yeah. So they're basically poisoning some aspects of the simulator that evolution should not latch onto and varying mildly the things that it should exploit so that it generalizes to those features. What does 100% uh, noise mean? Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, I'll give you an example in a moment. Yeah, okay. We'll, we'll see what 100%. Basically, it's every time the robot encounters an instance of that phenomenon, it's completely different. Okay, we'll see an example in a moment. Okay, so uh, you might recognize this robot. It's not the Roomba. Roombas didn't exist yet, although Roombas were inspired by this robot. Anybody remember? The Kepra robot, the hockey puck type robot. Just to refresh your memory, we've got six infrared sensors on the front, two infrared sensors on the back, and two ambient, I'm sorry, this should say ambient light sensors. So ambient meaning these sensors are not directional. They're just picking up the ambient light level around that sensor. Infrared sensors, again, they send out a pulse of infrared light and the sensor measures the amount of time for the pulse to come back. The longer it takes for that pulse to come back, the further away is the object that, ca that caused the infrared beam to bounce back to the robot. Yeah. Okay, two wheels, two wheels on a robot. So eight, uh, I'm sorry, eight plus two sensors, 10 sensors plus two motors. They're going to evolve this robot in a simulator to solve a very old problem taken from psychology. Psychologists love to put rats in mazes. As we all know, this is the maze. This is the T maze. We're going to place a robot in the T maze, but imagine we put a rat in the T maze instead. We put the rat in the base of the T. The rat starts wandering around, and if it wanders far enough up the stem of the T, suddenly a light will flash either from uh, through the wall to the right of the rat, or a light will flash through the wall to the left of the rat, and then the light will blink off again. If the rat continues to wander up into the junction of the T and turns in the direction in which it had seen the light, there's going to be a piece of lovely cheese waiting for it on that side. And sure enough, if you do this experiment with rats long enough and randomly flash the light on the right or the left over and over and over again, the rat will tend to stop turning left or right with 50% chance at the junction, it will tend to turn in the direction in which it saw the light, from which you can conclude that the rat is capable of memory. It remembers on which side it saw the light, and when it gets to the junction, it knows I should turn in that direction and get the cheese. 
We can uh, throw away the rat and take organism X and do the same experiment. And over time, if organism X or species X starts to turn in the right direction more often than not, we can conclude that that particular species is capable of memory. Make sense? Seems great, right? It's a test of memory or whether you can learn to hold, use short-term memory. Thinking about thinking is difficult, dangerous. This experiment is flawed. You do not need to remember in order to solve the T-maze. We were all students of embodied cognition. How? If we put you in the maze and you hadn't had your morning coffee and you didn't feel like trying to remember which side you saw the light on, there's an easier way to solve this task. You like move to the side of the, um, the light when you first see it and then you just follow them. Fantastic. It took you all less than 60 seconds to see the flaw in this 100-year-old psychology experiment, right? The minute you start thinking about the body or the interaction of the body with the environment, suddenly this becomes trivial. I see the light and I learn or I discover that if I just touch the wall where I saw the light and then I just keep going, I don't need to remember where I saw the light. When I get to the junction, whichever wall I'm holding on to, I turn in that direction. So they're going to evolve this Kepler robot with a little neural controller inside that connects the 10 sensors to the two motors. They're going to evolve it to solve the T-maze. And if they put some recurrent connections in here, maybe the evolutionary algorithm will evolve memory for the robot, or maybe evolution will rediscover this solution. Yeah? There's multiple ways to solve this task. Okay, so we're going to evolve the robot to do this. We know the robot, we know the sensors, we know the motors, wire them up. We now need a fitness function. So we're going to create a fitness function as follows. Every time we drop a robot with a given neural controller into the base of the T-maze, we let it run around in the T-maze in simulation for 10 seconds. And then at the end of the 10 seconds, we measure D1 and D2. D1, how far did it travel up the stem of the T-maze? We want to obviously reward robots for traveling up the stem. If they, stay at the, uh, if they stay at the base of the T, that's no good. We also want to evolve them when they get to the junction to move uh, along uh, either to the left or the right. So we're going to also reward for D2, which is the amount uh, of distance they travel either in the upper right part of the T or the upper left part of the T. So basically reward for travel, and then they get an extra 100 points if the robot happened to turn in the right direction at the junction. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay, we have a population of random neural controllers. We drop each neural controller onto our simulated robot in the T-maze multiple times. And for each neural controller, we drop it into the simulated robot multiple times and randomly flash the light at the left or the right and sum up this term, sum up this equation for multiple evaluations of the same neural controller. That's the fitness of that controller. Run our evolutionary algorithm. Delete neural controllers with low fitness. Make randomly modified copies of the surviving controllers. And you can imagine it doesn't take very long to evolve a neural controller for the simulated Kepra robot to solve the T-maze. I now give you the physical Kepra robot. You download your most fit neural controller onto that physical Kepra. I give you a physical T-maze. What do you think the chances are that that physical Kepra is going to do the right thing? We wouldn't be talking about this if it did the right thing. Usually, it doesn't. OK, so the hard part here is not formulating the fitness function, making the simulator, coming up with a good way to evolve weights and all the rest of it. It's how do we ensure that it evolves to solve the task? yet doesn't glom on to any details of our simulator that are incorrect. So they're going to start to sprinkle noise into this situation. Here's the first strong hint about what they're going to do. They're not even going to simulate a T-maze. 
They're going to simulate the stem of the T in phase one. And if any given neural controller drives the robot sufficiently high up the stem of the T, they're going to teleport the robot into the t center of the intersection and then measure D2. They are not simulating the intersection itself. Why not? It could hug the wall, but that's perfectly valid here. Hugging the simulated wall and hu hugging the real wall, perfectly valid. The walls might be slightly different in reality. That's OK. The friction, if it does touch the wall, and assuming we simulated a wall with a little bit of friction, that friction or the interaction with the wall would probably go in the base set. The walls are going to exist in simulation and reality. What detail of this environment is probably going to be very, very, very different between simulation and reality? The fact that they're not simulating the intersection at all is a strong hint. There's something about the intersection that is particularly problematic, particularly inaccurate. And not necessarily, no. As the robot travels up the stem of the simulated or real T maze, the intersection is approaching in simulation and reality. Is it the gap in time between when it sees the light and when, like, because if it just teleports to the center, it'll pop immediately or something? Uh, no, not necessarily. So we're we're gonna if the robot, uh, if the robot has large D one or a particular controller achieves high D1, that controller is driving the robot all the way up the stem of the T, past the light, it's seen the light, the light is turned off, all good, then it teleports. It could be. We're getting close, right? Something about the geometry of the T maze relative to the robot. No? OK. OK. We'll come back to that then. OK. Let's talk about the simulation itself. I, I kind of mentioned the T maze. This is three years before physics engines were existed. The simulator in this case is an Excel spreadsheet. It's a lookup table. Sounds crazy, right? Turns out you can do it. Here we go. This is about as minimal as you can get. This is the simplest simulator you're going to see in this entire course. There are two tables in this Excel spreadsheet. Did Excel even exist back then? I guess so. Anyways, OK. Table one uh, is basically a lookup table. So in that lookup table, we take, um, we take the robot's orientation. What angle is the robot currently facing? So you can imagine 360 rows in this lookup table, one for each angle that the robot could be at, uh, each, each degree of orientation that the robot could be at, which is visualized by these arrows here. And we take the forces arriving at the two motor neurons. Remember this neural controller has two motor neurons that's trying to send torque to turn the wheels? There's no simulated wheels. So what do you do with the motor neurons? If both motor neurons are firing with positive values, that's the motor neurons trying to spin both wheels forward and move the robot forward. You could have one motor neuron firing with a negative value and with a, uh, the second motor neuron firing with a positive number, and that's the neural controller trying to spin the left wheel back and the right wheel forward. So we've got these 360 rows. We can imagine actually many more than 360 rows, where we have now three columns. We have the angle the robot is facing, the value of the first motor neuron, and the value of the second motor neuron. The motor neuron values are floating point values, so we could have an infinite number of rows. So let's discretize this a little bit. 
So basically we're going to this table and we have our neural controller. We know the current angle of the robot. We know what the two values are that have just arrived at the, motor, the two motor neurons. We go look up those three numbers in table one. And there are two additional columns, the fourth and the fifth column in this lookup table that indicate the new X and Y of the robot. Everybody see that? Seems kind of strange, but a very simple way to do things. So in this lookup table, they basically ran a physical Kepera around for a little bit at random and measured the, the orientation of the robot and the values arriving at the two motor neurons of the physical Kepera and just wrote that out into a table. So these are sort of a lookup table snapshots of the robot's physical uh, experiences. Table two, a little bit trickier, given the robot's orientation, again, its current angle in degrees, theta, and its distance from a wall, whatever the, close, the wall is that it's facing, when the robot is in the T maze, no matter what its orientation is, it's always facing a wall somehow. Look up the robot's current orientation and its current distance from its closer, closest wall, and the third and final column in this second table is time, the time it takes for an infrared uh, signal to go out and come back from that robot at that orientation that far from the wall. So table two is basically containing a simulation of the sensors. Table one is containing a simulation of how the physical robot might move. Make sense? Okay, so we're running on a computer. We're running the neural controller. We set the, the, the values of the sensor neurons, according to table two, propagate the sensor neuron values through to the motor neurons, take the motor neuron values and the state of the simulated robot, look up the new position of the robot, update the X and Y and orientation of the robot, look up its new sensor values, plug them back into the neural controller, and around and around you go. The neural controller running on your simulated robot, that neural controller is affecting the robot, uh, robot's interaction with the physics engine, which changes the input neurons. In this case, same thing, we're evolving neural controllers, but these neural controllers are talking to or interacting with an Excel spreadsheet. Everybody see that? Okay, so when I, we were talking about a simulated T maze, there, there isn't really a simulated T maze, there's just these tables. There's one third table, which is about the light sensor, but it's more or less the same, the same thing. Okay. Okay, given all of that information, why do they not simulate, why do they teleport the robot when it, the, when it enters the intersection of the T maze. What is it about this simulator, these tables, that you can particularly not trust? A lot of the data, all of the data sitting in these two tables, it all came from the physical robot, but some of the, some of the data sitting in these tables is more trustworthy than others. Which data do you trust the least? If the robot is here, sitting in here, it's got its eight infrared sensors. Those eight infrared sensors are sending out signals into this environment, and we're trying to measure the time at which those signals come back. Forget about it. Very, very tricky. Particularly unreliable. If the robot happens to be sitting right here and it's actually facing the wall, we've got the orientation of the robot uh, facing the wall and dy. dy here is very small. The robot is very close to the wall and it sends out an infrared signal directly into the wall. We can trust that signal. It's going to be short. And if the physical robot does that 
a hundred, a thousand times, we're going to get more or less the same time interval back. Very trustworthy. If the robot is sitting in a more complicated environment, a junction, or it's facing a piece of black cloth, we can execute, we can record from the infrared sensor over and over again. And even if the robot is still, or maybe just moving a little bit, the values coming back are going to be very, very different. Super, super difficult to simulate these sensors when the robot is inside the junction. So when the robot is inside the junction, I'm going to just skip ahead for a moment. When the robot is inside the T-junction, we're going to add 100% noise. At that moment, when D1 is high, the robot is near the junction. But the junction, it hasn't even entered the junction yet. There is no junction. There's just this lookup table. Or D2 is very low. It's just entered the junction. That neural controller is still running. That neural controller still needs values for its input neurons. For its input neurons, we send in completely random numbers. You can imagine the robots driven into the junction, and we start dropping mirrors and cloth into the intersection. We're completely bedazzling the robot. It can't trust. It's completely disoriented when it enters the junction. We're simulating that by returning from this lookup table, not the values in the lookup table, but completely random values. Right? You've been inside all day wearing sunglasses. You go out at noon and suddenly take off your sunglasses. You're disoriented. You can't really trust your perception for a few seconds until things settle down. That's what they're doing to the robot. That's the implementation set. Make sense? OK, I see a few puzzled glares. Any questions before we push on? Yes? So what is it about its sensitivity about the intersection that makes it not so difficult to evaluate? Because like, yep. it's a lot of volume to just to where it's not really able to evaluate. Great question. OK, so what exactly is it about the junction that's so problematic? As you're going to see in a moment, they're going to actually transfer this to reality. So imagine a physical T maze. Let's say we're poor researchers. We made this out of cardboard. We cut a little hole in the cardboard for the light to go through. The robot happens to be uh, sitting right here. It's about to enter the junction. And its, it's infrared sensor sends out a, a signal in this direction. Maybe this outgoing infrared pulse happens to graze the inner corner of the cardboard and gets a little bit corrupted. Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe it doesn't hit the corner and keeps going. We made this thing out of cardboard, out of corrugated cardboard. So maybe the forward-facing piece of the cardboard is completely uh, flat, but just behind that, that piece of the front of the cardboard, there's a little bit of corrugation inside the cardboard. It's a little denser or a little less dense. That messes up an infrared pulse. It's going to reflect or, or disperse in some strange way. Maybe there's some dust in there. Or there's the logo of the company on the cardboard. It's a little bit darker. It's a little bit lighter. There's a gazillion things that can go wrong. Some of those things can also go wrong in other parts of the maze as well. But things get really hard in here. The geometry gets a little more complicated. Let's not even bother. Let's just completely bedazzle the robot when it's in the junction. So that from evolution's perspective, the evolution should just assume don't rely on your sensors at all when you're here, when you get to here, or and or you magically are transported to here. What does that mean? What does that mean for evolution to say it can't rely on its sensors? It has to rely, it has to just do blind reckoning, right? You're stumbling in the middle of the night to go use, use the restroom. You know the layout of your room. You kind of just do everything from rote memory and hope for, the, hope for the best, right? Your sensors aren't working. You can do it, right? This robot can do it, presumably. 
Hopefully that means that when they take this physical robot and drop it in the physical T maze, there's something about the lead up to this. It's the robot remembers that it saw the light pulse about three seconds earlier, and the robot remembers that it's been turning its wheels for three seconds since it saw the light. Okay, okay, okay. I should now stop relying on my sensors and turn either left or right and then go straight. That's in essence what we're hoping evolution does. Make sense? Okay. As mentioned, there might be other things about the physical T maze that are also unreliable. So they're also going to add a little bit of noise to the base set. These are physical features of the simulator, the lookup tables, that ha probably has some correspondence in reality. For example, how does the robot move in response to its motor signals? So in table one, whenever the neural controller look, is trying to figure out the new position of the robot, this table sends back the new X and Y position of the robot, and it randomly alters X and Y by a small amount, by about 10%. Yeah? Okay. So that's true. As the robot is driving around, its motors aren't perfect. Maybe there's a little pebble on one of its wheels so that it bumps a little bit as it's driving along. Probably a safe bet. Okay. How the infrared sensors respond in the stem or in the top of the T maze. Again, maybe there's a company logo on the cardboard. So don't trust the, re the time of reflection of the infrared pulse by too much, just by a little bit and keep going. Okay, how the ambient light sensors respond, add a little bit of noise to the light sensors, and we'll see how things go. So far so good? Okay. Additional things that they also modified. So these, uh, this researcher set a good precedent by saying, be paranoid. Like a good coder, assume that everything can possibly go wrong in reality. So every time they ran the robot through the simulator, they altered the side from which the light comes. This is an important thing for the experiment itself. Flash from the left, flash from the right. The width of the corridor, the starting orientation of the robot in the base of the T maze. Is it pointing up and to the left? Up and to the left in the T maze. Is it pointing up and to the right in the T maze? They're varying everything. The length of the light zone. How big is this little window through which we flash the light? The length of the corridor. When I say they varied all these things, what they ultimately did is went back to those three lookup tables. The lookup table for movement, the lookup table for the IR sensors, the lookup table for the light sensors, and they modified things that simulated varying these aspects of the robot in reality. So far, so good? Okay. Okay. Question? Uh, when did you, like, when did you decide that you're, like, changing enough versus that you're, like, changing too many things that, like, because if you change too many things, it's going to not move, but if you've changed all these things, how do you know which one is, like, no one has a good answer to that question yet, right? How do you know when you varied things too much? You definitely know when you varied things too much because evolution will not be able to make any progress. It'll evolve, a con uh, it'll evolve. Controllers will continue to cause the robot to move around randomly in the base of the T maze, right? That's evolution saying, I, you keep changing too many things. I just don't know what to do. I don't know how to evolve a neural controller to even increase D1, let alone D2, or go after the cheese. So you tune down noise, and suddenly evolution starts to make progress from one generation to the next. Neural controllers start to evolve that get bigger values of D1, D2. The controllers tend to get the cheese more often than not. But maybe you've put too little noise and will fail to cross the reality gap. We're back to this. Uh, we're back to this Goldilocks problem, right? Not too little, not too much, but how do you know? The answer here is they don't know. This is what they did. And they managed to evolve a controller that l evolved the ability to always turn at the top of the T maze in the direction in which it saw the light. <coughs> so what did the investigators do? Cross fingers, hope for the best. We'll see the result in a moment. 
Let's have a look at the evolved controllers. Looks pretty familiar from what we've seen before. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here's the eight infrared sensors. Here's the one, two light sensors. They imposed bilateral symmetry. So they only evolved weights for the left synapses. And whatever the values were for the left sense, uh, synapses, they copied those values onto the right synapses. Right? We've seen this before. Generally speaking, bilateral symmetry is a good thing. We all know that. Don't, evolution doesn't have to reinvent, reinvent, reinvent it. Just give it to her. But she's got to figure out which weights to assign to these uh, synapses. You'll notice that some of the synapses are inhibitory. Those are the ones with white arrowheads. Some of these synapses evolved to be excitatory. These are the ones with black uh, arrowheads. You'll notice that there are some recurrent connections and self-connections. What you're looking at here is a visualization of the most fit neural controller. In the minimal simulation, this neural controller caused the robot to always get the cheese, no matter which side they flashed the light from. Did this neural controller evolve to cause the robot to fall, hug the wall when it sees the light? Or <coughs> did this neural controller evolve to remember where the light was and turn in that direction when it gets to the junction? or when it gets teleported into the top of the T. Not easy to tell, but you've had a few tries at this. Any hints you see here one way or the other? Uh, the um, two front uh, sensors, they're, they have, uh, they're connected to the, well, the offset with the left and right motor. So like if it sees it on the left side, the right one will spin faster, so it'll, it'll go in that direction. Like, Okay, That's, so you see that there is an, an ipsilateral connection going from the front left infrared sensor to the right motor, and there should be the same thing on the other side. There it is. But these are the infrared sensors. These are just the proximity sensors. The robot can only see the light from this sensor and from this sensor. Tricky. Ah, there's a very strong hint. Yeah. And then they inhibit the, the opposite, like, direct infrared motor that then goes to the motor. Yes, so some good observations in there. It's a little bit strange. We see an outgoing, we see outgoing synapses that are outgoing from sensor neurons, innervating or connecting to other uh, sensor neurons. It's a little confusing. You can basically think of these black circles as hidden neurons that are connected to the, the sensors. A little confusing. You mentioned that the two light sensors are mutually inhibiting one another. It turns out that they didn't build this in. This is something that evolved. And it is ubiquitous in us as well. There are many, many neurons and clusters of neurons in your head and in your spine and throughout your body that mutually inhibit one another. This is one of the greatest hacks Mother Nature has ever come up with, and she's come up with some amazing hacks. What does mutual inhibition do? It's often hard to see, but in this minimal experiment, it makes sense. Remember when we talked about Breitenberg vehicles and we kind of mentally simulated these neural controllers in our head? If this light sensor fires, then it, it excites, it inhibits. What's going on here? Is it like it's focusing on that and cutting out all other inputs? It's cutting out, it's inhibiting everything else. So let's imagine this neural controller is sitting inside the simulated robot. It starts to drive up the stem of the T and we flash the light from the right, bam. Ambient, uh, this particular sensor, sensor neuron uh, ob obtains a very high positive number. And there's a little bit of light that also falls across the robot's body onto the other light sensor as well, but less. 
<laughs> at this moment in time at which the right hand light is flashing on the robot, this ambient light sensor is firing more strongly than this ambient light sensor, and then click, the light goes off. What happens? The one that doesn't see it becomes negative, or becomes more be negative. Why? Well, it's because the one that saw it is inhibiting it, so then that one becomes negative, and so then it the, the not inhibits the like other way around, so it makes the one more the one that saw it more positive. Correct. So this is a tricky thing about neuroscience and neural networks, right? It's a double inhibition. We've got two things that are inhibiting one another, but at a given point in time, the right-hand light sensor is stronger, which means it's more strongly inhibiting the other one. So at the moment that the light is on, the, the, the delta or the difference in values of these two light sensors may be slight. They're both high because the light is on, one is a little bit stronger than the other, starts to push down this one. This one is also inhibiting this one, but its value is dropping, so its, in, its ability to inhibit this one is decreasing. And so as the light switches off, this happens. One goes to its maximum positive value, and the other drops to its maximum negative value and the robot keeps driving. What's happened? What has this mutual inhibition done for the robot? Memory. Memory. It's remembering, yeah? OK. So it may or may not also be hugging the wall or exploiting some aspect of its interaction with the team A's, but this one is definitely has evolved to remember on which side it saw the light. OK, not really important for the reality gap discussion today, but just to reinforce this idea of what's going on in the heads of these robots. OK, here we go. All this build up for this. I'm going to turn off the light for a moment. OK, here we go. 1997, no fancy cameras. This is the best we get. No YouTube videos. What's happening? Uh, it's doing pretty well. It's doing pretty well, right? That should be the first obvious thing. They stuck a little, uh, a little LED on top of the robot, and they shielded that LED so that the ambient light sensors couldn't see it. It was just for the camera person from above. What else, what other observations can you take away from this attempt to cross the reality gap? It doesn't seem to be hugging the wall. It doesn't seem to be hugging the wall. So if it's exploiting its interaction with the environment, it's subtle, it's something that's beyond us to see. It may or may not. It's definitely remembering, as we just saw. What else is going on? It almost looks like it's almost hitting the, um, like the wall where it's not. Yep, so it's, exactly. Remember that when it gets into the intersection, it's probably kind of, or it's, the neural controller is not relying on its current sensory information. How this neural controller evolved to ignore the incoming sensory information in those situations, that's tricky and complex. You'll just have to trust me. There's a way that neural controllers can do this. In the same way that they can remember things, they can also inhibit or ignore their current sensory information and drive their motors just from internal memory. So the, again, this is like us stumbling around in the middle of the night, right? They go a little bit too far, but then they still manage to remember enough to know in which direction to turn. In fact, they remembered which they know which direction to turn in in every case, at least all the ones that the investigators reported. What else is happening? What else did they test here, the investigators? Different starting positions. So you can see down here, they tested the robot in this T maze starting from two different initial positions and at two different orientations. And even though they were varying the initial conditions of the physical robot, it's in all of those cases, this evolved neural controller could handle it. Crazy simple robot, crazy simple experiment, but this feels like a pretty trustworthy robot. It doesn't guarantee that there isn't some teammates in some situation in which it's going to go haywire, but pretty good. 
What else did the investigators do on the other side of the reality gap here? Absolutely. Remember, in simulation, they were very, among other things, they were varying the width of the T maze, so they wanted to test that in reality. Did that altering the width make this neural controller robust to the width of the maze? And the answer is yes. Any other observations? They, they reset it every time, right? So every time it gets the cheese, they take it and put it back at the bottom of the stem of the tea maze. OK. OK, it doesn't look like much, but this was the beginning of at least in, I'm going to turn the light back on. In the case of a simple robot, you can cross the gap. It's not, the gap is, can be large, but it's not infinite. There are ways to train or design robots in simulation that transfer to reality. So everyone got very excited about this experiment when it came out. And I was just starting as a master's student in this lab at Sussex when this all started. There was a lot of excitement that it was possible. If only we could have better simulators than these bloody lookup tables. This is ridiculous. This isn't going to get us very far. In 1999, in the UK, a games company visited some of the roboticists at Sussex and said, hey, we're making these new things called physics engines. Would they be of any use to you? And we all said, oh my gosh, yes. Thank, thank goodness for this. So the rest of what we're going to see in this section, and as we've already seen in most of this course, we're going to now look at physics engines. We've got eight minutes left. So we'll start in on the second attempt to cross the reality gap. In 1997, we learned that, OK, you can sprinkle noise, but you've got to know what to sprinkle noise on. Oh, OK, OK, all right. Still not a very satisfying answer. Can we do better? Can we automate things more? In 2000, three years later, there was a publication in Nature magazine of a second attempt to cross the reality gap. And this got quite a bit of media attention. It ended up on the front page of the New York Times in August. And the, scientists, uh, the, report, the uh, journalists reported that scientists had made the first robot that makes its own robots. Right, here we go. Terminator's coming, it's the end of the world. Great science journalism on the front page of the New York Times. Obviously, crossing the reality gap isn't something that's gonna make it onto the front page of the New York Times. The way in which these researchers attempted to cross the reality gap made use of a new technology that excited and scared the hell out of a lot of people. It wasn't a physics engine, although that was also new in this experiment. There was one other thing that was new in this experiment that scared the hell out of everybody. Any ideas? Is it three different things? Here's the physical robot. All the white parts of the robot that you see here are made from thermoplastic. It's a particular type of plastic that has a very low melting point. So in 2000, there were also manufacturing firms that were starting to make these new things called 3D printers. They, they came to see these researchers at the time and said, do you have any use for these 3D printers? And these researchers said, you know what? If it's difficult to cross the reality gap, we evolve something in simulation and transfer it to reality, and it doesn't work. OK, maybe we can't always guarantee that everything will cross the gap. But if we make or evolve a whole bunch of things in simulation and make not just one robot, but hundreds or thousands of millions of robots, some of them presumably by chance will cross the reality gap. But who wants to sit down and manually build hundreds or thousands or millions of robots? Wouldn't it be great if there was a machine, a robot, that could make robots automatically? So the, what became known as the Golem Project was an attempt to cross the reality gap by bringing together two new technologies, evolve robots in physics engines, evolve lots of robots in physics engines, and then print a whole bunch of them in reality with the hope that some will cross the gap. Okay. 
Again, the, the, the reporters were referring to robots making robots, which is a topic we will actually come back to later in this course, where we're going to look at self-replicating machines. This is an idea that was actually formulated by John von Neumann uh, just after the Second World War. We'll talk about that in a moment. This is the, what you're going to see at the moment are not self-replicating machines, at least not yet. You're going to see 3D printers that make robots, not robots that make robots. OK, so this experiment, this attempt to cross the reality gap, the, this experiment is made up of three different steps. Step number one, evolve a robot, not a robot controller. S several things that are new in this experiment. The first one is that they're evolving not just the brain of the robot, but they're also evolving the body of the robot. Uh, we're approaching the end of this course. As we continue on, you're going to see more and more experiments in which the investigators are going to broaden the evolutionary algorithm. So now it's not just optimizing synaptic weights for a fixed neural controller for a fixed robot. It's going to, the evolutionary algorithm is going to start to tinker with body and brain uh, simultaneously. Here's, we're going to see an example of that here. Once they evolve the body and brain of a virtual robot, send that body and brain to a 3D printer, which will manufacture the robot. And then step three, in 2000, these 3D printers could only print plastic. So we could only manufacture parts of the robot. And then we're going to manually snap in all the parts that 3D printers at that time could not print, which were motors and electronics. OK. Our focus, of course, is on step one here. How did they actually evolve these robots? They evolved these robots with an evolutionary algorithm. We've seen many. Here's another one. In this case, the genotype is uh, a list that's made up of four lists. This is the blueprint. The blueprint is a list of four lists. The first list is a list of vertices. It's a list of triplets where those triplets specify the links or the parts of the robot. Each ball here has an x, y, and z coordinate in three-dimensional space. Mutations in this evolutionary algorithm can add triplets or remove triplets from this list, so we can add or remove parts to the robot's body. The second list is a list of one, two, three, four quadruplets, or four tuples. Each four tuple describes a bar. A bar connects some vertex of the robot to some other ver vertex that makes up the robot. And we have a relaxed length and a stiffness for that bar. That language should sound familiar. Where have we heard that language before? There's a spring. So you don't see the spring in this picture, but you can imagine that every bar connects a pair of vertices together. We cut each bar in half and stick a spring in the middle with a given relaxed length and a given stiffness. So far, so good? OK. So these first two lists tell us how to build the body of the robot. The second two lists tell us how to build the brain of the robot. The second, uh, the second, or sorry, the, the third list here is a list of neurons. In that list, if there are n entries in that list, there are n neurons inside that robot. Each, the description of each neuron, there's a threshold associated with each neuron. That should also sound familiar. Threshold of what? What do we threshold in a neuron? The activation function, right? So as always, the neuron is getting some raw weighted sum, and then we're going to threshold it somehow, and evolution is going to set that threshold. And every neuron is followed by a list of synapse coefficients. This is a synonym for synaptic weights. Every neuron is going to send out synapses that connect to every other neuron in the neurons list. So we end up with a fully connected neural network like you see here. We've got one minute left. The fourth and final list is a list of actuators. Each actuator is described by three numbers. The first number indicates which bar, uh, which bar is the neuron attached to. And 
which uh, is the actuator attached to, and which neuron does it attach to. So an actuator is connecting a neuron to a bar, which turns that neuron into a motor neuron that's sending a value to the spring inside that bar, and that value is gonna tell the motor inside that spring whether to extend that, string, that spring or compress that spring. We have a genotype that encodes the body and brain of a robot. We'll pause there for today. You have a quiz due tonight. Undergrads, you're working on assignment 10. Grads, you're waiting for me to drop D5, which I will do at 3 p.m. Thank you.